Uh, is there like a stylus for it? I mean, I don't think we're necessarily going to need it. Oh, there's one over there. Okay, so. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so we're going to start with 2010 then. Everything set up? Yeah. Good to go. Cool. All right. Have a read. Okay. Um, is it D? Yeah, it's D. So yeah. why the D? So lysosomes are definitely not visible, uh, and neither is the endoplasmic reticulum. Goes with the Yeah. Um. So that leaves. D. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And if mitochondria was were ticked here, would would that be would that be okay? Would that work? No, because it's not stained. Good. It's it's also just well, too small. Yeah. Okay. So chloroplasty are the biggest. Um, and if that said chlorophyll, would would that be visible underneath? Well, that's. That's what's stained, isn't it? Yeah, but would you be able to make out the chlorophyll molecule? No, no, no. Because they're they're even smaller than any of these, yeah. so they sometimes try and catch you up by that. So okay. just make sure you know chloroplast versus chlorophyll. Okay, cool. Let's go down to the next one. Is it B? Yeah, it's B. Why is it? Um, because neither mitochondria or the rough endoplasmic reticulum carry out transcription. Yeah, good. Now, why might you think the mitochondria does carry out transcription? Um, maybe because they supply the ATP. Yeah. Used for a lot of transport. Okay. They also have mitochondrial DNA. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So which needs to be transcribed, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't happen in the mitochondria itself, that happens in the cell. Um, okay, good. Three. Is it D? Um, why, why D? Because... Well, first of all, what is the graph? Okay, so the IP scribe call is... So when you're looking at a specimen, you see like a line that has divisions. Yeah. And you'll have a micrometer to see actually, like what the actual length of it is. Yeah. With the, man, with the magnification, and with the micrometer, and the IP scratch kill, you can find the actual length of whatever you're looking at. Yeah, okay. And so why do you say D then? The grad kill makes comparisons. Well, because you can't... Well, a grad kill itself, you can't make measurements by, so... Well, that's how I... Yeah. Like, if you just have... Maybe 
it's a. <laughs> yeah. It is a. Okay. Um, they're like, so but you can you can use you, the graph to fine. make comparisons, but yeah. the, the, it's a fallacy here because it's saying that the graticule itself makes comparisons, okay. which I know is frustrating, but the graticule itself doesn't do any thinking, obviously, so it can be used to make comparisons, just like if they wrote here, the graticule makes measurements. I knew that B and D, uh, B and C were definitely incorrect. Yeah. Um, and then it was just wording. Okay. Cool. Next question. A. Good. So. Okay, um, so I know that 40 eyepiece units um, or graticle divisions equals 0 0.1 uh, millimeters. Okay. Um, and 0 0.1 millimeters is equal to uh, 100, 100 micrometers. Good. So, 40 divided by 10 is 4. Good. Good. B. Good. Let's see. Okay, why does it say? Because so it's not polar, it's not soluble in water. Mm -hmm. Um it's less dense than water because it floats on water. Okay. Uh and then it does have a higher energy value. Um and it has more hydrogen atoms because it has a long hydrophobic carbon silicon tail. Good. Yeah. Uh, hey. Okay, so just quickly give me the, what the results for these tests okay. mean. So, Benedict's solution uh, can be to, uh, to test for reducing sugars, uh, pureed uh, proteins, and iodine solution is for starch. Uh, yeah. Uh, D. Good. And why the link is found in the other um, polymers of certain polysaccharides? Okay, um, amylose alpha 1, 4, um, amylopectin alpha 1, 4, and 1, 6, because it's bronchi. 
Good. Uh, glycogen the same. Uh, yeah. And then cellulose. We yeah. go here. Good. Thanks. One. A. Yeah, good. So why isn't it P, C, or D? Okay. So it's not important for living organisms. <coughs> B is not important. Um, be true. No. One is ice. Uh, well, it is important one? actually for fish, but um, ice is less dense. Yeah, good. I just knew that A was correct. So. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, D is not correct because big increase of heat energy raises its temperature. What's that called? What's that called? High specific heat capacity. Good. I will see. What's that one? Uh, uh, condensation reactions. No, it's not used in condensation reactions. It's produced. Good. Very good. Okay. Good. I think we skipped the question. Oh, yeah, wait, that's <laughs> See. Good. So, I'm kind of the direction of 30 degrees. Okay, uh, it's B. Okay, why is it B? Um, because the, so the concentration of the product increases even after X. So not all substrate molecules have been used up. Yeah, okay, so why is an A, C, or D? Um, because not most of the enzyme molecules will have free active sites. So There'll be many enzyme substrate complexes um, because they're still colliding with the active site. Yeah. But there's just more substrate left to collide with it. Um, and the rate wouldn't remain the same if more enzyme was added because enzyme is the limiting factor. Good. D. Good. And what's number three called? End product. End product inhibition. Yeah, good. Or you could call that negative feedback as well.
B. Good. Okay, okay. Um, you can hear me Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, um, normally for this, I like make up a number for the water potential of the planet itself. You okay. can like draw one outside. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So <laughs> um okay. See? So talk talk me through the thinking. Okay. <laughs> um so water will uh move by osmosis from high to low water potential. Yeah. Um, so it'll move into the plant. Yeah. Uh, cells. So the... So the cells will, will become turgid. Okay. Turgid. Um, so it's definitely not B. Good, B is on the end. Um, and then... I didn't really know. Okay, so um, A, C, or D. What's, so tell me what's the difference between the three. Like the shape. So mm -hmm. one's more upwards, other one's downwards, and the other one C is like linear. Okay, and in each of those pieces there's a, a thin line and a thick line. What do they represent? The the epithelium. Okay, so what's the difference uh, between the thick line and the thin line? Well, there's a cuticle. Okay, there's tell me the properties of a cuticle. Um, it's thick. Mm -hmm. uh, waxy cuticle, uh, it prevents too much of the transpiration. Okay, so that's really key. So, transpiration, thick waxy cuticle is basically, it's not going to allow diffusion of water so it'll allow osmosis it yeah. can't go through the cuticle so what you're looking at is three different pieces of leaf that have been or stalk sorry that have been put into this solution like this and you have to determine they're all turgid they've all taken some water up but in which configuration would the would it increase the water potential the most What do you mean? So the, what they're testing here is your ability to determine that basically if you put it in like this, mm -hmm. you're going to be increasing this, the surface area of the stalk exposed to water, the thin walled inner cells. So if you put it in this way, mm -hmm. these thin parts are going to be going in first, so there's going to be the most movement of water into it because the wax cuticle isn't preventing water from getting in. Okay. Whilst if you put it in these configurations, it is less, you'd get less movement just because of the surface that's exposed. Here you've minimized the surface of the waxy cuticle. Whilst yes. here you've either kept it the same by putting it in flat or maximized it by curving it. Okay. And that, so the answer is A. Okay. Does that make sense? Like, I, I get why there's less surface area yeah. uh, of the waxy cuticle, so more water will diffuse into the plant. But I don't get why that means that that's the piece and why it's, why it's not that. Like, so, so, 
surface area, do you know how surface area determines diffusion? Yeah, as well as more surface, surface area means like increase of diffusion because yeah. there are more entry points or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what's determining the water potential of the stock here. So if you have a greater surface area, then you can get more water into the piece of plant. Okay. And in A, you have the, the large surface area of thin-walled inner cells, which are able to quickly... So open. the shape is a result of water diffusing into the plant, or the plant changes its shape? No, so the these are four different pieces of plant. So they've just been cut out of the plant in four different ways. Okay. And then they've been put in to four different solutions, and they're asking you to point to the one that will have the highest water potential. And A has the highest water potential because it has the lower... Oh! Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, I thought, okay, I was... Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah, it's been good. Why? Because so high sucrose, higher sucrose uh, concentration means a higher solute potential, which means a lower water potential. So yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Okay, this isn't yeah. relevant. No. B. Mm -hmm. Next one. B. Good. Cool. Let's take a break there. Yeah. Quickly use the bathroom.
All right, let's just finish this paper. So, 21. Yeah, see. Okay, good. Okay, um, is it B? Yeah, it's B, so talk me through this one. What's the key column here to be looking at? Um, so, your cell and planning. Yeah, good. So, if your cell is present, yeah. which base must not be present? Mm -hmm. Uh, if your cell is present, then thymine is present. Okay, so that makes which column thymine? C. And then it's just in case of C. Which one is similar. Exactly. Good. Okay, uh, is it B? 
okay, so why are you saying B? Okay, so it's either B or D. Um, Good. Because DNA polymerase adds uh, DNA nucleotides. Okay. Uh, and then I didn't really know, so I thought unwinding of the parental DNA double helix. I just saw unwinding, so yeah, okay. <laughs> it was tension. Um, but it does also. So well, it's saying that it enables, the answer is enables tension caused by unwinding to be released. So um, it would help if I had a piece, piece of string here. But basically, if you have a double helix yeah. and you put your fingers between the helix and unwind your, by yourself between two parts, yeah. then at the other two ends, you're going to get a really high increase in tension because you're basically, by unwinding in the middle, you're passing all that tension onto the two parts laterally to it. And what topo isomerase then does is it cuts the DNA and allows the two sides that are adjacent to where you've unwound, maybe it'll help if I try this out. Sorry. You basically have your DNA like that. And let's say I want, let's say my genes here and I want to go in and uh, transcribe it or replicate it or whatever. So you've unwound, you want to unwind this middle part. So what you get is something like this. And all the tension that was in this middle part is then transferred to these two side parts. Mm -hmm. So they want, basically the forces inside them want them to be further apart from each other just to unravel a little bit because you've just increased the amount that they're wound together. Topo isomerase comes and just cuts. It'll do one at a time. It'll cut these, allow the two lateral parts to unwind, and then it will rejoin them. And by doing so, it enables tension caused by unwinding to be released. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. And so the answer is C. Uh, sorry, the answer is D. So that's what topo isomerase does. Mm -hmm. um, helicase makes strands available as templates. You understand that it's literally just unwinding it. So then you have two template strands. Single strand binding protein prevents original strands reforming complementary bases. So what they're saying here is that it binds to separated strands to stabilize them. And that will make sense then because if you have two separated strands, if you can't somehow bind and stabilize them apart from each other, they will literally just fall back on each other and bind. So that's what they're saying here. Mm -hmm. And do you know what polymerase does? Yeah. I mean, it could be that back in 2009, the functions of helicase and topo isomerase was, you know, part of the syllabus, but... Let's move on. Okay. Good.
Um, so is it D? D. Yeah. Um, Old B. <laughs> so the answer is B. Um, the way I'd approach a question like this is, you know, first of all, make sure that the options you look at are uh, are actually features of zeophytic leaves, mm -hmm. um, and that should eliminate two and four. Okay. Pretty much immediately because you can you can't have two layers of epithelium. It's always going to be you're always going to have one epithelium, right? Okay. And small surface area to volume is the opposite of what you get from effects like moving the leaves and sinking the stomata. You actually increase. Wait. Okay. Sorry, I might be, I might have confused myself there. Um, yeah, no, sorry. You do get small surface area to volume in zoophytic leaves um, in plants such as, can you give me any examples? So what, what is the zoophyte? Um, a plant that has adjusted to conditions and square waters and that about to get an example of that kind of plant? Uh, like desert plants. Good. So, like? Cacti. Yeah, cacti. Good. Um, we've talked about sunken somata before. Yeah, I knew sunken somata and think cuticle were yeah. correct. And you can see the stomata, yeah. the sunken somata here, and you can very clearly see the thick cuticle. So it's either B or D, and the question is, can you see two layers of epithelium? That's why I was, like, you can kind of see that the, maybe the epithelium is. Yeah, so I guess it's the wording here. So you technically have an epithelium and a cuticle over it. They're not, they're not both the epithelium, as it were. So here you'll have epithelial cells that form the outside of the leaf proper. And on top of that, you have the waxy cuticle, which is separate to the epithelium. It is, oh. I guess, it's quite- Is it because the epithelium itself can consist of like three cells, or is a layer just like one layer of single cells? So the epithelium itself can consist of- multiple Like many, layers. okay, that's, okay. And also the sur small surface area to volume. You're not really seeing that here because you have sunken stomata and features like that, which actually increase the surface area of this leaf. I thought small surface area to volume maybe because it's so like big. That's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, it, it as a so zeophytes, the plants themselves on the whole will have a small surface area to volume. But if you're looking at just this leaf, yeah. it's hard to say that. Yeah, you don't even know. Yeah, yeah you don't yeah. even know any of the measurements. Um, yeah, that's really important. Okay. Oh, I uh, uh, A. Good. So, what are the different pathways? Apoplastic and symplastic. And what are the differences? Apoplastic is to the cell walls and symplastic to lacrimal plasma and dysmata and cytoplasm. Good. Okay. So, which one of those is symplastic? B, C, and D. Good. See. Okay, talk me through this. Produce transpiration and sets up the gradient for water movement. Okay, and 
when we talk about water movement, what's the force that governs that? What causes water to move? Like a high concentration. Yeah, and movement of water from a high concentration to a low concentration. What's that called? What's that force? Diffusion. When we're talking about water. Transfers. Osmosis. Uh huh. Yeah. So when they say diffusion of water to the stomata, well, yeah, that's so that's the misleading answer. They, oh, I've addressed it to you before. They often put one that's almost the right answer, and it's supposed to mislead you. Um, you actually have osmosis of water through the stomata, and you, you can't really use the term diffusion when you're talking about movement of water. So it's it's a different answer then. So is it D? It's D, yeah. And why isn't it A or B? Um, because that's like a byproduct. A. Good. So, yeah. It yeah. like replaces the boss water. Um, and B. More negative. Yeah, good. Um, I said closed. Yeah, why do you say closed? Uh, because it occurs in vessels. I yes. said it occurs in vessels. Um, double or single? Single. Why? Because it passes through once, passes through the heart once. Yeah, good. So we have essentially one ventricle yeah and to have a double circulation you need two ventricles to be pump pumping the blood to two places does that make sense yeah good and where well what kind of organism is this uh, a fish yeah probably <laughs> <laughs> and so you've got the oxygen coming in at a site that's not necessarily going to go through the lungs before it goes through anything else, and that's the gills. Okay. Uh, okay, valves of the heart. Which valves are open or closed when the atrial relax and the ventricles get tracked? See. Good. So, what what stage of the heart cycle are we talking about? Here? Ventricular system. Yeah, the system. Yeah. B. Okay, talk me through this. Alveoli have elastic fibers, uh, don't have cartilage, copper cells, smooth. Yeah, good. And what, so what's the property that allows alveoli to contract and relax them, if not smooth muscle? It's the uh, elastic fibers. Yeah, good. B. Good. I'm going to 
Zdawał na ciemno. Hmm. Oh. Hey. Good, and what are they testing here? A tube versus virus. Yeah, good. D. Good. Um, so, why might you think that it's C instead? Um, so, the answer yeah. one, mosquitoes become resistant to insecticides. So, you, the fact that that could still cause an outbreak in a country where it's been eliminated, how? How can mosquitoes that are resistant to insecticides still cause malaria in a country where malaria has been eliminated? Because, like, that's a transition path, transmission pathway. Yeah, and when we're talking about elimination, what are we, what are we saying? What does it elimination of malaria mean? Well, it means that nobody's like suffering. From yeah, malaria. good. And the the key point there is that. You've eliminated it from humans, right? Yeah. So the mosquitoes can still be carriers. They can pick it up from another country and bring it in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If it was eradicated, then it would still be. They'd still be talking about humans. Yeah. So okay. both of those terms are used with reference to humans. To get rid of malaria in mosquitoes, you have to either kill all the mosquitoes or do something that stops the mosquito part of the life cycle uh, and both of those methods have not really so far haven't really proven to work out effectively okay any response Uh, D. Yeah, good. And why isn't it, um, why isn't it C? Because T helper cells, when they bind with the antigen, they activate it, and they produce cytokines, which activate the specific B lymphocytes, good. not the other way around. Good. And how do they make sure they only activate B lymphocytes that have receptors that will bind to the antigen. Um, they produce cytokines that only the specific B cells will be activated. That would be that would have to be a really complicated cytokine <laughs> that, that says only B cells with this receptor should be activated. Um, it's not quite. So you have pathogen with an antigen. T cell comes, binds to the antigen. Yeah. Um, and now this T cell is going to release cytokines to activate B cells, but yeah. only B cells with the specific receptor yeah. are going to be actually activated. So what has to happen to tell that B cell you have the right receptor? You are allowed. It has to bind to the receptor itself. It has to bind to the antigen. Yeah or it has to bind a process part of the antigen that says this is what the T cell found in the first place. So what T cells often do is pick, take up a pathogen themselves and process. So this is this often happens with the C killer cell, uh, T killer cells or cytotoxic T cells, um, whereby through signaling and destruction of the cell, 
they can pick up proteins and then process them themselves and put them on receptors, which B cells can then bind. And if the B cell successfully binds it strongly, it'll receive more cytokines that say you're the right kind of B cell, you're allowed to proliferate and become activated, differentiate, et cetera, et cetera. Good, yeah. And let's just go look at these. Oh yeah, okay, D. Why is, it, why is it D? Because you can clearly see the locked nucleus of S, uh, and then R, I think it's monocyte, and then T is the large nucleus for the lymphocyte. Okay, so you've got S and T, right? Oh, oh R, sorry. R, you think R is a monocyte? Yeah. And is a monocyte a lymphocyte or a phagocyte? It's a phagocyte. Yeah, good, so that would be D then, right? Yeah. Oh, you said D. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said B. <laughs> I thought you said B. <laughs> no, I said C. No. You're right there. You're right. Okay. Uh, and then you've just got these food chain questions. Okay. Let's add that there. Um, I'll just close all of these. Oh, uh, well, they're all, yeah, they're all people. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I'll just leave that one too.
Okay, so can we get these side by side? Yeah, should be able to. Can we? Yeah. And then what we can do is have. Is this the paper? This is the paper. Okay, perfect. So we'll want that up here. And then if we have this here, then we can scroll down and look at it. Okay. Without having to switch tabs all the time. That's good. Okay. Um just Okay, labeled diagram of leaf palsy mesophyll cell, looking down at via light microscope. Impressively high quality light microscope. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Wait, do I write it down or do I like... So it's your choice here. You can, what we can do is either you write down your answer and we can just mark it, or we can talk through it. If we talk through it, we'll get through more questions. I'll talk through it. I'll talk through it. Okay, let's talk through it. Well, if you, if you want, in the future, you can always send me a paper and I can just mark to you exactly how the examiner would and give you your mark back. Okay. It says, with, you know, comments on... How you brew if you want. I might do that. Yeah. Feel free to do that at okay. any time. But um, for the purpose of getting through it fast, let's just talk through it this time. Yeah. Okay. So why same same magnification two marks? Um, because the electron microscope has a higher resolution yeah. than the light microscope. Uh, resolution is um, the ability to distinguish two points from each other. Uh, the resolution of an electron microscope is 0 0.5 uh, nanometers, uh, while the resolution of an electron microscope is 200 nanometers. Good. Um, and uh, so the way resolution works is you have wavelengths of radiation and when they interfere with the and uh with the specimen or with the with the points then you can distinguish them from each other good very good you definitely get both marks there uh we'll check here to see if there's any additional ones that you could have picked up so you said high resolution good that's one mark you said more easily able to distinguish between two points good mark and then the alternative mark is from Coding the resolution difference, which you which you did, and you did it correctly. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, you easily pick up the two marks there. Um, okay, describe three additional features that could be seen on the electron microscope. Just describe three to me. Okay. Um, lysosome. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice. So, um, does it say structures or does it say like features? Okay. You could see the uh, ribosomes. Um, okay. And you could see the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, cool. So you've listed three structures to me, lysosomes, ribosomes, and ER. The question says describe three oh, additional okay. features. So you're going to have to give a little more than just... Yeah. So talk me through each of those. Okay. Um, so ribosomes are spherical Good. structures, um, which are made out of RNA. Okay, not okay. so important, yeah, but okay. where are you going to find them? Uh, and you'll find them in the cytoplasm. Uh, distributed in the cytoplasm and on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Good, that's perfect. You get a mark for that. Uh, 
And um, what did I say? Lysosomes, uh, they'll be present in the cytoplasm. Yeah. Um, and they have a spherical structure. Okay. Uh, and what did, ah, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, they'll be distri distributed like throughout the cytoplasm also. Okay, okay. Oh, be a bit more specific for endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so, okay, um, they will be close to the nuclear envelope. Okay, yeah, you're on the right lines. Uh, um, one type of ER is close, but it's more than just close to the nuclear envelope. It's part of it. Yeah, it's, it's part of the Exactly. It's actually formed from the outer membrane. The smooth end of plasma particulum. The smooth is found in the cytoplasm, as you said. Yeah. Um, good. Now, this question said describe three additional features for each of those. You described a feature that you described a whole organelle that you can't see. And you got you did it correctly, you get the marks. Another way you could have answered this is to talk about structures within the organelles. So could I talk see. about like the grana, the grana? Grammar. Yep. Uh, I, I could have talked about pigments, maybe. Yeah. Um, enzymes. No. Mm -hmm. No. Maybe. No. Okay. So you'd see the for the chloroplast, you'd see, you know, what you're telling me now. Yeah. You'd see more detail in the membranes, and that yeah. that would be seen for the mitochondria as well. Okay. Um. The nucleus, you'd see the double membrane, you'd see pores, that kind of thing. These are all things that you will talk yeah. about to get pick up marks. Um, let's check the marking scheme. So, yeah, so here they talk about so much you can talk about. Yeah. The first three they talk about are just for the detailed mitochondrial chloroplast ribosomes, and then smooth ER, rough ER, ER in general, Golgi vessels, creature vessels, lysosomes. Mm -hmm. Heterochromatin, talking more about the nucleus and the little nuclear pore. That's cool. You got it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, next question. Do you want to do this? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Okay. Um, amylose is has an alpha helical structure uh, and is not branched, while amylopectin is branched. So amylopectin has both alpha one four linkages and one six linkages, while amylose only has one four. Alpha glucose linkages. Good, you pick up the marks there. Stay one roll of magnesium ions. I mm, I don't know. Okay, so magnesium ion. we have there is a list in the end of the chapter that will that states all of the important ions for plants. And okay. I'll give you um it'll give you like the function for them. So included is like magnesium, phosphate, and a bunch of others. And you do need to know it. Okay. Um, if you, uh, I can send you a link That'd be good. with it highlighted or boxed. Um, but yeah, so it's loads of different things for chlorophyll structure, ATP functioning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, it's not a big deal, it's just one more. Um, let's move on. Okay. Go ahead.
No, you don't have to select on that. Supposed to be cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you label it. Yeah. Uh, and like the same here. You don't do it. You can just draw the lines, like at the point. Okay. Um, Did they say label? Yeah. Okay. They said label the inner and outer membrane. Okay, so. Good. And I do like a Good. Okay. That's one of them. Um, you did five marks there. Let's see what they specifically wanted you to pick up on. So, obvious bilayer. Good. You got that. Glycoprotein. Good. You could have drawn a glycolipid. Oh, yeah. Um, one type of protein drawn a label as protein. Yeah, that's fine. You want child protein. Get another point for qualifying the type of proteins. So Integral transmembrane. You did there with tranol and you did there for carrier. So then yeah. you got another mark and cholesterol. That was yeah. your last mark. Um, you could have labeled hydrophobic core. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Detail phospholipid. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So skeletal filaments, that's... What would they look like? It's pretty hardcore. They look like... Um, so I'll just finish. They're like proteins that are part of the cytoskeleton. Right? Yeah, and to... So I'll just draw on this part. So uh, you'd have to firstly indicate cytoplasmic side and extracellular. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you would have filaments, which would be bound via proteins. It, it would look something like this. And there might be another anchoring protein by which this is sort of aided. So there might be a wonder, some kind of interaction between them that allows the actin microtubules to be bound to the anchor protein, something like that. I mean, ultimately, these sketch drawings are all going to be very unrealistic. Yeah. They're all just schematic. So as long as you really clearly, you know, wrote actin microtubules or cytoskeletal element, etc., etc., and you could even point down there and say to, to microtubule organizing center, then. 
you definitely get the mark there. Um, okay, that's good. It's a very common question. You need, you need to be able to whip out definition for fluid mosaic. Fluid because um, phospholipids diffuse throughout the membrane, so do some proteins. Um, and mosaic because the appearance of the membrane due to um, due to different size proteins uh, having an irregular arrangement throughout the membrane. Okay, and you know what? How you make that picture, that image? How do you take that picture of the from above? Yeah, and do you know the technique used to produce it? No. It's called freeze fracture, where they basically freeze the bilayer and then they cut it in two. That's where the freeze fracture come, comes from. This is how the people who originally identified it did so. And then they take either side and they just do an EM and then they'd see the, the configuration of all these different proteins. And that's why they called it mosaic what you're actually seeing is you know loads of essentially broken up proteins because normally in the membrane you have integral proteins but when you freeze fracture them they you know you're essentially cutting them in half um but yeah you pick up the most of that so as you did always comment on fluid and then comment on mosaic um yeah you pick up a little more so You know, this is yeah. ecosystems. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus. Good. Um, um, Protoctus. No, you get it. You could also say protozoa. Um, uh, plasmodium. Uh, malaria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and bacterium. Good. Uh, other causative organisms for malaria, other than malaria, Fowley. Alicarum? It's similar. Falsicarum. Falsicarum. And Vivax. And yeah, Vivax. Ovale. Yeah. So those are the four main ones. Um, okay. Do you have to stay in malaria? You'd have to, yeah, because yeah. the name of the cause of organism is species on genus. Um, I can double check that. Too. Oh, they would have expect they would have accepted if you wrote plasmodium and then bracket SPP, which just means species. Oh, um, but, but often fine. there have been questions where they're literally like plasmodium mm -hmm. one type of species or something. Yeah, they'll they'll say like plasmodium falciparum cause is the biggest cause of malaria. Name two other okay. causative organisms. Five X. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Wait, is that color on this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Prophylactic drugs. Mm, it's simpler than that. Um,
don't know. Antibiotic? Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I would have, yeah. That's not. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> So yeah, give a reason why. Because uh, it's caused by bacteria. And uh, antibiotics they, basically target bacteria. Yeah, they kill or they prevent growth. Good. So the vaccinations could cause herd immunity. Okay. Um, so the vaccinations, their job is to stimulate a real infection and give um, artificial active immunity. So. Uh, they trigger the primary immune response. So when you're infected with the real causative agent, um, you'll already have memory cells. Okay, good. But they're not asking you to explain how vaccines work. They're just asking you to explain why the numbers contracting the, the disease have decreased and not only in vaccinated children. So you've already told me that this is because herd immunity, but you haven't explained to me what herd immunity is. Oh, oh okay, wait. Okay, um, yeah, so herd immunity is where um, you prevent transmission of a disease within a population by vaccinating uh, everybody. Uh, so this can be done by newborn children being vaccinated, um, and it prevents the yeah, transmission. Okay, cool. In that sense, you have everybody vaccinated and nobody has the disease. But in this question, they're saying sp specifically they've only vaccinated some people, but more than th just those people no longer have the disease. So why have the effects of the vaccine gone beyond just the people who are vaccinated? I don't know. Okay, so I think in general, I want you to think about the sort of socio-demographical effects as well. And I know it's kind of, it can be laborious, and it's not, it doesn't seem to necessarily relate to biology, but often these are like the simplest, easiest marks for you to pick up in the paper too. So people who are vaccinated um, can te literally just inform people who aren't vaccinated about avoiding Causes of transmission. So surveillance and epi the epidemiological. Yeah, that's good. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Money is saved because people are vaccinated, don't have to be treated with drugs, and that money can be spent on education programs, on telling, teaching people what they should be eating and what they should be eating. Because we already said, they've already told you that typhoid is spread through food. Um, money can also be moved into improving sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, not only are the people who you're actually actively treating protected, but the society in general becomes protected. Um, I mean, you don't need to make these points, but often it's they're the easiest points to make. Um, if we look at this, uh, so they've said, Vaccinated children are immune. Okay, that's fine. Heart effect, you, you said that. And then explain the heart effect. So that sufficient people are vaccinated to prevent spread to susceptible individuals. Um, and then example of another factor that, can become, that became effective, i.e. less money spent on drugs, so more for better diet, prevention method described to avoid food, water contamination, that kind of thing. 
Mm. Yeah. With regards to the herd effect, make sure that if you're talking about herd immunity, by immunizing people, the, the most potent part of herd immunity is that is not the fact that everybody's immunized. It's the fact that by immunizing most people, the virus just isn't spread or the pathogen just isn't spread because it, its presence will decrease so drastically. And therefore, even people who aren't necessarily vaccinated can become under this umbrella of herd immunity. It's not going to be passed to them because nobody has it because most people are vaccinated. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Do you want to take a break then? Yeah. Okay. See you. Okay, so talking about typhoid. Now the following questions are going to go into mechanism a bit more. So, uh, okay. Uh, so we have so both phagocytes and okay. So bacteria and self cells both have proteins, uh, antigen proteins, um, and. Um, 
bacteria have foreign antigens while we have self antigens okay. uh, and phagocytes recognize and bond to the antigens of the bacteria because they're foreign good yeah can you get the more so okay uh, Um, lysosomes, no, uh, they can't be destroyed by hydrolytic enzymes. Okay, why am I, why am I to be honest? Um, to... because they have different receptors. So. Okay, so there, you're saying that there is a resistance mechanism there? Yeah. Okay, good. Or, inhib or like they produce an inhibitor for, for the enzymes. For the lysosomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's possible. Anything else that they could potentially inhibit? Uh, they could inhibit uh, endocyte endocytosis, phagocytosis. Well, they're actually saying that the typhoid are able, uh, able to, to survive. Yeah. Um, fusing with the lysosomes. Good, exactly. So fusion of the phagosomes and the lysosomes is a really important one that a lot of bacteria use. Um, yeah. But yeah, you get the mark for saying that they somehow develop a resistance mechanism. Um, next question. Okay, classic one. Why do people with HIV AIDS why are they more susceptible to infections? Uh, okay. Um, because uh, HIV uh, infects helper T cells Good. and uh, destroys them. Mm -hmm. uh, and helper T cells are responsible for the coordination of the immune response. Uh, so there's a decrease in number of of T cells, um, so becomes uh, less likely that the healthy T cell will bind with the antigen. Yeah, so you basically have more opportunistic infections. Yeah, because it becomes immunosuppressed. Yeah, good. All right, state the structural features of DNA that make it a stable molecule. Uh, okay. Um, well, it has an alpha helical structure or form um, due to the hydrogen bonds that okay. occur between complementary nucleotide bases. Okay. Um, uh, Uh, yeah, <laughs> is that not enough? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can probably talk about, okay, just talk to me about the structure of DNA, and then you can just mark about. Okay, so, um, it's made out of two strands. Um, mm -hmm. So the two strands and the hydrogen bonds, yeah. good, you've talked about how that stabilizes it by putting two strands together so you have a double helix. Yeah. What else keeps DNA together? What kind of what other bonds are there in DNA? Oh, uh, uh, um, sugar phosphate, sugar, uh, sugar phosphate bonds. Yeah, good. Sugar phosphate backbone is, you know, covalent bonds, very strong. Yeah. Well, they contribute to the stability of the molecule. Good. You pick up the marks for that. Um, let's just have a look then and see if there's anything else you could have commented on. So one mark for complementary base will try together. Okay, you, for you would have actually got both marks if you just write because of hydrogen bonds. So that's fine. Um, 
And so yeah, the other mark was for the sugar faucet back, but another mark for saying double helix. Double helix, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. DNA has genes, and these genes are made up of a specific nucleotide sequence or um, triplet code sequence, whatever. Um, and um, so it's important. So uh, during transcription, when mRNA molecule is produced, that goes on to synthesize a protein. Um, it all depends on the sequence of the gene. Good. You get the box for that. So DNA has been described as a carrier of coded information. Your marks here come from saying that DNA carries genes. Genes hold the code for for, for, pro proteins. for proteins, yeah. yeah. And genes are transcribed to MRA, which are then translated to other proteins. So you probably pick up extra marks for saying things like triplet code, yeah. etc. etc. Uh say when during cell cycle DNA. Good. Do the alleles of the gene for beta hemoglobin plug on time. Describe it and explain the difference between HPAs and HPS. Okay. Um, so the nucleotide sequence uh, for these alleles are different mm -hmm. due to a substitution mutation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, one specific nucleotide is, uh, is substituted with another nucleotide base, Good. Um, and this results in, oh, do I get, yeah, this results in a different amino acid being synthesized, which, uh, which affects the primary structure which affects the secondary structure, tertiary, quaternary structure of the hemoglobin. And thus the function. And thus the function. Good, perfect. You get the same. Okay, DNA pole is an enzyme. You know that? Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So as A R A A T P um as the concentration increases, um, the activity decreases, uh, the rate of syn DNA synthesis decreases, um, as seen in the graph. Uh, so the ARA ATP acts as a non-competitive inhibitor okay. to the DNA polymerase. Okay, why non-competitive? Uh, because um, the, so it changes the, well, that's not why, but they never reach the maximum velocity. Okay, so really important here, whenever you're gonna comment on an enzymatic reaction that's rate versus time. Always, always, always talk about Vmax and Km. And 
you've gotten you've gotten to the point of VMAX. And I know how you know that's an uncompetitive because the max comes down as opposed to the curve being shifted. But the way they want you to explain that is to say increasing concentrations of ARA ATP decrease VMAX but don't affect KM. Therefore, ARA ATP is likely to be a non competitive inhibitor. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You get the marks for saying structuring. Do you have, do you get marks for what? Saying how non competitive inhibitor works. Yeah, definitely, because they're saying in terms of the mode of action of enzymes. So, yeah. I mean, you probably even pick up marks for saying that a non competitive inhibitor binds to a side separate to the. Yeah. Well, let's see. And changes the shape of the enzyme, and for less enzyme substrate complexes are formed. Yeah, it's all there. Okay. Oops. Okay. I'll just point to them. Okay. Uh, oh, what's up? Good. Uh, coronary artery. Yep. Um, okay. The mammary artery. Um, Pulmonary, um, no, yeah, pulmonary artery, like here. Yeah, so you've got your pulmonary trunk. So this is what you're thinking. You've got your pulmonary yeah. trunk here, and it splits into left and right pulmonary arteries like that. Yeah, and that will be the pulmonary vein. Good. It? Yeah. Uh, oh, but okay. So right atrium. Well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Vena cava. This. Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. Right. Mark. Mark it for me. Okay, no, no, incorrect. No. Is it this? So let me just clarify something for you. So this, um, this black line here is just supposed to be showing oh, you the left. So atrium. I could have just done anything like up to here, really. Yeah, like anything. it bypasses all of that. So th this is fine, but like this. Exactly. Is so this, anything upstream yeah. of the bypass. Okay, so let's think about this then. So you, they want you to talk about achieving a balance between prevention and cure. What does that mean to you from like a public health standpoint? Why would you want a balance between prevention and cure? Well, you don't want everybody to be getting on the right. Yeah, okay, so I, I haven't looked at this marking scheme yet, but probably you pick up a mark for just saying prevention is ultimately better than cure because it carries with it less associated costs, et cetera, et cetera. So technically for all diseases, we want to be able to prevent them more than we want to be able to cure them necessarily. Now they've said that coronary heart bypass surgery is one, is the most common heart 
surgery, which probably isn't true these days. But anyways, with reference to discuss the difficulties in achieving a balance between prevention and cure. So let's say you pick up one mark for saying that you want you want prevention more so than cure. Now, why might that be difficult? Because it might be hard to track yeah. people who are not going to suffer from the disease. Okay, what disease are we talking about here? Uh, Arthrosclerosis. Yeah, okay. good. Do you know? Oh, how is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. So you could prevent it like by stopping people from smoking or increasing the taxes of smoking. Or yeah, and why is that difficult? Um, so why is it difficult to reduce our atherosclerosis? Because smoking is a highly addictive. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, because of nicotine. Yeah, okay. So smoking is a big factor, diet's also a factor, age is a factor. All these things we're talking about are basically the streams that you have to target for prevention and they're really hard to target because people don't necessarily see the benefit immediately. They, are not, they don't necessarily have symptoms until it's already too late and they need the cure, which is the bypass surgery. And the cure is relatively easy to give versus prevention because you literally just get a patient who presents with symptoms and signs and you know the cure is to perform the surgery so you perform it but it has with it associated costs associated mortalities associated morbidities and it would ultimately be better if it was prevented instead and the core marks for this question are going to be talking about why it's difficult to prevent instead of cure and we've gone through it by saying that smoking is addictive, et cetera, et cetera. Changing people's lifestyle attitudes. But that's the kind of way you're going to want to structure this answer. I think these type of questions that are like not by all that logical, <laughs> yeah. those would be a bit too, like, cursor. Yeah. This, yeah. Okay, sure. I'll have a look and see if we can find some. But yeah, for this one. They basically go through just this okay. yeah, cost a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, let's stop there. Yeah, it's fine too. I will stop the broadcast. Yeah.